Greetings, folks. My name is Colin Gillum, and I'm honored to be the director of your National Naval Aviation Museum here in Pensacola, Florida. I started my own Navy career in Pensacola, Florida over three decades ago, and it is an absolute thrill to be back as a director and oversee this phenomenal facility with our 60-acre campus, our 150 airplanes on display here at, in Pensacola, and the 1,000 airplanes we have on display across our great country. Um, again, as a career naval aviator, it's an absolute wonderful joy to be around all these airplanes day in and day out. But people always ask me, what's your favorite airplane? And I would have to default to the airplane I first flew in the fleet, the EA-6B Prowler, which you see pictured behind me here. I had the opportunity to fly this airplane for the balance of my Navy career, logging almost four, over 4,000 hours in that particular airframe. The EA-6B is a carrier-based electronic attack airplane, four seat, and uh, it was first uh, produced in 1971 in its first flight. Before I tell you a little bit more about this airplane, I'll tell you a little bit about the history of the Prowler and how we got there. During the Vietnam era, with the advent of surface-to-air missiles, the Navy realized it needed to better protect its strike aircraft. So it decided to take a modified version of the venerable A6 intruder you see here, which is a two-seat medium attack bomber, uh, Grumman product, and they stretched it out. The, EA, the A6 that you see here, two-seat, uh, and you see the tremendous bomb load on it. Well, Grumman took the EA-6B from this platform. The EA-6B essentially is a longer version of the A6. It is five feet longer and 4,000 pounds heavier than the straight A6. Instead of a two-seat cockpit, it has a four-seat cockpit. A little bit about this airplane that we have in our museum, the bureau number 156481 uh, was one of the first production model EA-6Bs, production model four, and it was one of the first to be designed from the keel up as an electronic attack airplane. Um, it started its life flying in the fleet and with VAQ-129, and as you can see here from the markings, it ended its uh, flying career at Test and Evaluation Squadron 23, doing test and evaluation. But over the course of its uh, time in service, it saw many, many hours, uh, principally with VAQ-129, the Fleet Replacement Squadron, and other fleet squadrons in Whidbey. A little bit about the EA-6B airframe itself. As a carrier-based aircraft, space is at a premium. You'll see here the wings fold to provide more space on the flight deck. We can get as many airplanes on that flight deck as possible such that we can maintain our combat readiness. Another interesting feature of carrier-based aircraft is they don't require a lot of support equipment. Everything on the airplane comes, uh, is integral to the airplane. I give you this example so our boarding platform eliminates the need for a bunch of support equipment on the flight deck. This is how the air crew would get into the, uh, to the airplane. And once you're in, fold it up and closed up. Again, four seat cockpit as opposed to the two seat A6. You have the pilot in the left front seat a naval flight officer in the right front seat, electronic countermeasure officer is what the folks that flew the Prowler are called. Um, and then in the back seat, you had two other electronic countermeasure officers, ECMOs, ECMOs two and three. The pilot was responsible for flying the aircraft safely on and off an aircraft carrier, on and off from a shore base facility. ECMO one sitting beside him, assisted in the navigation and the communications, while ECMO two and three in the back seat uh, were principally respond, responsible for running the tactical jamming system, the ALQ-99 system, that was the heart and the soul of the airplane to allow us to provide electronic countermeasures, read combating enemy radars in those surface-to-air missiles that were meant to uh, target our uh, friendly aircraft. 
what the way we did that, we carried uh, jamming pods on our store stations. And here's a picture of a jamming pod. And you know, it's a self-contained radio station, if you will. The Ram Air turbine you see at the front is uh, spins a generator and has those transmitters that work here. We would also carry the AGM-88 high-speed anti-radiation anti missile to kinetically take out enemy radars. It would essentially home in on the radar and destroy it uh, with an explosive device. You may ask, why do we not have any pods here today, LQ-99 pods? Absolute great question. Well, the LQ-99 pods that were used on the EA-6B are still in use today on the successor to the EA-6B, the E-18G Growler, uh, home based at Woodby Island uh, Naval Air Station in Washington State. That's why we don't have any, um, because they're still being used to this day. The EA-6B uh, has been involved in combat since 1971, uh, in the latter days of the Vietnam era, and it's been involved in every major conflict uh, through Desert Storm, Operation uh, Southern Watch, Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom, all the way up to the latest fight against ISIS. Very, very impressive, a, a go-to airplane to provide that electronic uh, attack capability to our Navy and to our Department of Defense. This is the only airplane in the Department of Defense's inventory that provides this unique capability. Now there's some interesting attributes to the EA-6B Prowler, like it's a older cousin, the A-6. You'll notice it has a very, very bulbous front nose. Uh, that's to uh, house the, uh, the radar that's in the front of the airplane. You may notice a the refueling probe that is fixed. That allows the airplane to do in-flight refueling. Many other aircraft tractable probe the EA-6B and the A-6 both have a fixed probe, which is one of the prominent features of the airplane, leading to some pretty unique call signs, nicknames for the airplane. The double ugly, uh, the stretch A-6, because it's a four-seater, it's been called the station wagon. Mom and the kids, and my personal favorite, the flying drumstick. That's because the pointy nose of this airplane counterintuitive to any person that flies airplane. The pointy nose of this particular aircraft is to the rear of the airplane. Anyway, uh, its rugged looks do not uh, tell the full story of this great airplane. It was rugged. You hear the term Grumman Ironworks, and this airplane was built to take combat uh, hits. It was built to uh, survive in the harsh environment on an aircraft carrier and the carrier landing. So the landing gear is very, uh, and it's a phenomenal airplane to fly. Um, because it has this pointy nose, it wasn't particularly fast, but one of the things that Grumman did that really made it a good airplane around the ship is they changed the engines from the, from the standard P8s to the Pratt & Whitney P408s, which provided tremendous thrust and allowed us um, to, to really, really operate um, with, with power authority around the airplane. Neat, neat jet. Any questions so far, Rihanna? Yeah, we do. We have one from Paul. He says, I believe the concept of two-person electronic attack has been proved out with the EA-18G, but did you have any initial reservations when you first were read into plans for the Growler? That's an excellent question, and, and he is correct. The EA-18G, with its two-seat crew, has done a phenomenal job taking over the mission of the Prowler, which was done with four. As I mentioned earlier, the two folks in the back were running the jamming system. Now it's the backseater and the pilot in tandem. The advances in technology have allowed us to do that. The Prowler, uh, again, with 60s technology, having been built in 1971 and had a phenomenal 44-year career, it flew all the way up into 2015. But the modern technology that came with Hornets, heads up displays, glass cockpits, the advanced uh, AESA radar really allowed two people to do the job before. While, yes, there was some concern early on, again, we knew technology would answer the bell. 
set aside the fact that E18G brings something the EA6B did not have, and that's a self-protect capability in that it was an air-to-air -air platform as well. Great question. So we also have one from Jesse. He is eight years old and he says, what's the stick at the front of the aircraft? Again, that's the air refueling probe that allows uh, the airplane to uh, take fuel from an, another tanker. It allows us to extend our missions. Many of the missions being flown today and in earlier conflict required six, seven, eight hour missions, which would require multiple refuelings in flight. It also allows us to refuel around the ship if we have a delay in getting back aboard the aircraft carrier. While I'm talking about the aircraft carrier, again, as a carrier-based product and a Grumman product, you see things that are not seen on land-based aircraft. This tow link here attaches to the catapult to allow the airplane to be slung into the air in only 310 feet to go from essentially zero to over 150 miles an hour in less than the length of a football field. You'll notice that the landing gear and the tires are very bulky to stand the impact of that controlled crash that is a carrier landing aboard Navy aircraft carriers. So while you're talking about carrier landings, Greg says, hey, Searles, have you ever boltered? Uh, great question. So what's a, uh, many of you on the, uh, online would go, what's a bolter? Well, first off, let me show you the tail hook, which is in its retracted position. And you can see here that it's retracted. Normally in flight, this uh, tail hook is retracted. When we get ready to come back aboard the aircraft carrier, uh, the, the tail hook is lowered. And as the pilot flies um, on the carrier, flies his approach, that tail hook drags this 55,000 pound, or this in this case landing weight, 48,000 pound airplane to a stop in 340 feet. So you hopefully catch a wire every time that you land. Occasionally, you may miss the wire. You land all beyond the wires or your hook just takes an unfortunate bounce and bounce up. And yes, I have boltered once or twice in my career. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Who was that, Greg? That was Greg. You're off my Christmas card list. Anyway. <laughs> Great. Another one, EA 6P Prowler, is it true that there was gold in the canopy? Uh, that is uh, a wonderful discussion. I showed you the picture of the jamming pods, and those are essentially television stations hanging off your airplane, and they generated a lot of electromagnetic uh, energy. So to protect the crew, there was a, a film, a lining, gold-plated lining um, on the canopy that allowed, that kind of reflected those signals uh, away. But a great question. So yes, there was protection for the crew there given the extensive uh, electromagnetic radiation this, this airplane put out. Other questions? So Steve says, you must be the only pilot I've seen with polished flight boots. Tell us about your time on the Enterprise, Sturles. Well, I'm sure many naval aviators have polished flight boots, uh, and mine are just street shoes right now, uh, albeit this is a non-flying status uh, that I'm in here. Uh, one of the pictures that was on your Facebook page was a picture of an ES-6B landing on board the U.S. Enterprise. I happened to be flying that airplane. It was when I had the good fortune of being the commanding officer of VAQ-141, the Shadowhawks attached to Air Wing 8 on Enterprise in 2001. Interestingly, on that deployment, we had just finished uh, supporting Operation Southern Watch, which was the no-fly zone enforcement in Iraq when 9-11 happened. We had just left the Straits of Hormuz the day prior, and we were steaming home when 9-11 happened. So, in a testament to the presence of carrier aviation, USS Enterprise, before the second tower had fallen, had already reversed course and was on station off the Pakistani coast on sundown of 9-11 to be able to defend our great country. And it was an honor to command the Shadowhawks on board that great ship, USS Enterprise. So Jim Allen says, can you talk about the delayed ejection sequence? Excellent. We'll walk back over here to the pilot side. So, it's a carrier-based airplane with ejection seat capability. 
There are four people in the airplane and you want to be able to get the folks out in an ejection should you need to eject from the airplane as quickly as possible. Well, to do that safely and make sure there's not a conflict with the various seats going out, there was a phased ejection. So you see the pilot is in the left front seat, the ECMO-1 is in the right front, ECMO-3 is in the left rear, ECMO-2 is in the right rear. So the sequence would go like this. ECMO-3, once the handle, uh, the ejection handle was pulled, reinitiated, that ECMO-3 would leave the airplane instantaneously. ECMO-2 beside him would go 0.4 seconds later. ECMO-1 in the right front seat would go 0.4 after that, 0.8 total after initiation. And the pilot seat was the last seat to leave the airplane 1.2 seconds after the ejection sequence. That may seem like a quick time. That's an eternity in a very, very evolving situation. Uh, but you needed that delay to make sure you had the separation uh, between the ejection seats. Um, great question in that regard, but it was one of, the, one of those factors you needed to make good decisions if you found yourself in an extremist situation as to whether to leave the airplane. And of that point, we built 170 uh, 70 EA6Bs from 1971 until 1991, and over the course of our 44-year history, we actually crashed uh, 51 of those airplanes. That may seem like a lot, but that's actually pretty standard for a particular type model series, given it's almost five decades of service. Other questions? So Mike Heidman asks, how does the holdback work? Does the holdback tension change with weight? Okay, the holdback fitting, this is the tow link, which you see here goes down and fits into the catapult track. And behind it, there is a particular feature that has a, a metal piece that's stressed to separate at a certain tension. Essentially, when the catapult is uh, armed, the airplane's loaded, the tow link's in the, uh, the shuttle, which is the catapult uh, structure, the holdback fitting allows the airplane to stay in place such that the pilot can go to full power and allow those engines to completely spool up without the airplane creeping down the catapult. When the combination of the catapult firing and putting all that kinetic energy applied to this tow link, uh, along with the thrust of the engines, that holdback fitting separates and, and fires to there. It, the holdback fittings were unique to each particular aircraft. The EA-6B had a particular holdback fitting. Other aircraft had a holdback fitting. Today, it's used with a mechanical tensioning device because one of the things in these days, you know, that holdback fitting was a, like a little dog bone. One part would stay with uh, the catapult with a trail bar and the other plane would go flying with you for your mission. And it was one of the first things that our plane captains did was take the holdback fitting and take it out of the uh, out of its fitting and typically throw it over side. Though I have a few that I've collected for memorable catapult shots and like my thousands and other things, but we collect those as well. Good, great question. Andrew Martin says, how many missiles did you have to evade in your career? And Gray also asks, did the AC ever take a missile hit? The aircraft is not taken, well, there was no combat losses. As I mentioned, we lost 51 in, in uh, operational training, uh, operational and training mishaps. Um, we have been very, very fortunate because of our dominance of the, uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, this airplane has not been, I was never shot at. We've typically had air dominance. That said, we've been involved in operational strikes since the airplane was put into service in the Vietnam era. Every major conflict, the EA-6B was there to provide those supports. And, and the folks in particular during Desert Storm had a lot of missiles shot at them uh, because this was a high value aircraft because it was providing protection for the strike aircraft. Jim Allen asks, or I'm sorry, Frank Rizzo says, have you ever had to use the barricade? I have not had to use the barricade and there's not been an EA-6B barricade. There have been uh, other Navy aircraft that have used the barricades. For those of you not familiar, uh, on a carrier, you have those four arresting gear wires, sometimes three arresting gear wires on the new newer aircraft carriers. But if for some reason you had a problem with the airplane, say your tail hook had failed 
or you had some landing uh, configuration that wouldn't allow you to do a normal landing, a barricade is essentially a big net that you catch the airplane in. And there's been a number of barricades over the years of Navy aircraft, but fortunately the EA-6B uh, avoided that fate. So Lawrence asks, I've read multiple times that the Prowler's refueling probe is bent to starboard compared to the intruders. Why the difference? That is an excellent, excellent observation. If you look at the EA-6B probe compared to the A-6 probe, and I don't know if you, the A-6 probe is a straight up vertical. The EA-6B is cannon 12 degrees to the right. Now, one of the things that Northrop Grumman was able to do as they built the Prowler, they were able to take lessons learned from their production of the A-6, the older cousin of the Prowler, and apply it to the EA-6B. So we have been very, very fortunate as EA-6B air crew to benefit from our older cousin, the A-6. And in this case, the cant 12 degrees to the right allows the pilot, that would be me, to be able to have better field of vision uh, as we fly around, particularly as you come back aboard the aircraft carrier so you're not looking around the probe. Great question, by the way. So we have a question from Lauren and she is seven years old and she says, my dad flies with pictures of me in his cockpit. Are you a dad and did you take your kids flying with you? I, I took my kids flying with the pictures. I did, uh, I, my uh, son and daughter now, 21, but uh, when I was uh, a commanding officer of the squadron, uh, and then when I had an air wing, I would absolutely take a picture of uh, my two kids, and it was great, and it was a wonderful thing. That said, when you're flying, one great hallmark of Naval Aviators is you compartmentalize and you focus on the mission at hand, so that love those kids, but you gotta focus on that airplane so you can get back to sea. Great question. And one final question we have is tell us about your favorite memory from your time aboard the Enterprise. Well, the Enterprise was, was a great experience. As I mentioned to you, it was a very sobering experience to have 9-11 uh, happen on that fateful day in 2001. And we had great empathy, and, and there's some parallels to today with, the, with what we're dealing with as a society with uh, coronavirus, but it was uh, really, really rewarding for me to be on board USS Enterprise, deployed and be in a position to defend our country and be one of the first elements to actually strike back after those horrible events of the terror attack of 9-11. So being part of Air Wing 8, having the wonderful opportunity to command the wonderful men and women of the Shadowhawks of that squadron, on that day, it was absolutely one of the most rewarding moments of my career, and it was done on that great ship, the USS Enterprise, which is our first nuclear aircraft carrier. Great. Thank you very much. We hope that you'll join us again for our future uh, editions of this Facebook Live at your National Naval Aviation Museum. And when we get back to life as normal, we hope you'll come visit us here in sunny Pensacola. Thank you. So join us next week where we profile the B-25 Mitchell with historian Hill Goodspeed. Tuesday, April 7th at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time, right here on Facebook Live. Have a wonderful day.